and, 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 and access to, to narcotics. You mentioned the factories that would be set up because Haitians want jobs. Yeah. Um, there is concern that you could, they could be setting up maquiladoras where, yes, they're desperate for jobs, but at any price? How do you guard against that? Yeah, not at any price. I think that the, that the you know, you're being here, and any time there's media and responsible media here is virtually more important than any aid organization's presence at all. Um, the, with, with that alone, people in the United States would get to know the Haitian people and send the money right into their hands. They'd adopt neighborhoods, they'd adopt schools. So when it, in, in terms of what the future is going to be, if we're just going to continue a culture of people making one to two dollars a day, spending 45 percent of their annual income on their children's education because they care that much to have their children educated, but with only the access to substandard education, then, you know, then if, if, if that doesn't change, it's only a pipe dream. People are going to have to have a life. They're going to have to share in the international language of, a, of what a real free life is, and we can't maintain the kind of um, uh, we're grateful for a penny aspect simply to, in what becomes the kind of systemic punishment for people's, uh, of people's strength. And that's what happens in a, in a place like Haiti where comfort's never been experienced on any level. There's no expectation or feeling of a right to it. But it's, it, it isn't a luxury, it's a human right. So here you are, a megastar in Hollywood. How have you brought your talents. What is it about what your experience has been that you can run a camp like this? It's an awful lot like film productions, just the stakes are a lot higher. So the choices you make with fluidity in film that you responsibly would call adjustments uh, here are without whimsy and are very clearly adjustments to, to the daily needs that, that, that occur here. Um, as an organization, one of the, the founding principles that I started with, despite the deficit it would put me in, was that we wouldn't take designated money. What we do is maintain maximum transparency. And so that, you know, if, if tomorrow the best thing for our, our organization to do is to recognize that we have degenerated tarps from the original distributions and to put another 8,000 tarps in our, in our camp for a big rain, if suddenly there's a social unrest situation, we might, might want to take our funds and put it into security for the, for, for the IDPs here. So we wanted, to, we wanted to maintain that kind of flexibility, and, and that's so much about what filmmaking is. And then I think just being, you know, learning that and dealing with these kind of organizations that are dealing, in, it's very competitive between NGOs, for example, as it is between studios, for example. Uh, there's a lot of schadenfreude, there's a lot of high school nonsense that we, we laugh about and we criticize in Hollywood, and here it's murder. It's a kind of passive murder. And so I think that in, in you know, simply being willing to uh, uh, talk very straight about what we see and hear, our best bet proposals and put them on the table and not be shy about them, and then count on that uh, like minds will, will, will coordinate where coordination in general doesn't exist. When you talk about that competition being dangerous, not only dangerous, lethal here, can you be specific? I can be extremely specific. I don't have to name any of the organizations, I think people know what they are, that we expect as a culture in America to have, in, for example, in Haiti, you have this incredible earthquake and the disaster that it wreaks. We see the agony and the death everywhere on the news, immediately. And we all say, oh my God, what are we going to do? Well, we've got this organization, and we've got that organization, and we've got the other one, and we've got the other one. Who'd have thought that four months later, we would get a patient in our clinic, in our hospital here, a 15-year-old boy that became the first diagnosed case of diphtheria. We, when we come here as Americans, are inoculated for about five things. One of them is diphtheria. So here's this case, and diphtheria is endemic here. And none of the organizations, from international to national, 
to American. No one had notified any of the hospitals. And no one, none of the hospitals had asked. Where do we get the immunoglobulin if we get a case of diphtheria? So, patient came in. We started looking for hospitals that would accept him. Nobody was prepared to accept him. We got kicked out of four hospitals, and we traveled with this boy in the back of an SUV for hours, from hospital to hospital, being kicked away. During that time, we had a phone campaign going. By the way, where do we get the immunoglobulin? We, had, we had, had, had been involved with every major hospital and clinic in the city. Nobody knew. We called the United States military, whose job it isn't to do that, and who, in fact, among all the organizations, had been the most directly decisive and effective of, of, uh, to date. And from this was about a 15-hour process. And I have a pretty good Rolodex. No one knew where to get it. And then, based on a kind of memory of somebody that was involved in one of these major organizations, we made a phone call and we got in touch with somebody from CDC while they were in a restaurant in Patientville. And they happened to be sitting across from the person who wrote, ran the Promess warehouse. And this is an immunoglobulin that has to be sent through a cold chain. And this was another thing that was exposed four months in. No cold chains have been set up. What's a cold chain? Cold chain, if you, if, if you want to send uh, tetanus diphtheria from the United States to here, it's going to have to stay cold all the way till injection. So then you get, to, so it's not centralized in one warehouse. And you, you would think four months in that they would have established cold chains, that organizations would have donated the fuel and the generators necessary to keep those ref that refrigeration there in the primary hospital in all of Port-au-Prince, General Hospital? No, nowhere, except in the Promess Warehouse, which was all the hell boot out of way out of town. And we raced with the father in the back of the tri pickup truck late in the night after we'd finally gotten General Hospital, where um, Dr. Megan Coffey had accepted him. And she was running the infectious disease wing there, and primarily uh, uh, TB, I think. And so they, they accepted him. And then we went off and, and, and got this stuff, and it was just too late. And about 10, 12 hours later, he was dead. So that's a basic lack of coordination that is, you know, it's neglect on the level of, of at least manslaughter. Sean Penn, the two-time Academy Award-winning actor and director, now manages a tent camp of 55,000 displaced Haitians in Petionville, a suburb of Port-au-Prince. By the way, yesterday we said the American Red Cross uh, received $1 billion in donations for Haiti. They called us to say that was inaccurate. According to the American Red Cross, they collected $468 million. They say so far they've spent $148.5 million. But I do have to say, one of the complaints that we heard over and over again in Haiti is, where has the money gone? Not just the American Red Cross, but all of the money donated to NGOs, the aid organizations, the countries. People on the ground are saying they've seen very little in terms of recovery efforts. We'll have more with Sean Penn after break. Stay with us. Mm -hmm.